Sup, chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, anybody who has dabbled in the lore of hair loss witchery is familiar with the drug Dutasteride. It is a 5-AR inhibitor like Finasteride that is FDA approved for the treatment of benign prostatic hypertrophy, BPH. But it also is something of special interest to the hair loss community due to its increased potency over Finasteride. Thus, oftentimes it is prescribed off-label for the treatment of androgenic alopecia for people who have extremely aggressive hair loss, even though for most people, finasteride will be strong enough to stop hair loss even when it's used by itself. Additionally, another benefit of dutasteride over finasteride is that it doesn't have as many diminishing returns as finasteride. Even though dutasteride's standard dose is 0.5 milligrams with about 51% scalp DHT suppression, you can safely titrate dutasteride up to 2.5 milligrams to get around 80% of scalp DHT suppression, unlike finasteride, which suppresses about 4 41% of scalp DHT, whether you use it at 1 milligram or 5 milligrams. So, I'm not going to go over which dose of finasteride or dutasteride is optimal for you. That is something you, you can discuss with your doctor, but if you want to know more about the effects of finasteride and dutasteride on hair loss at different dosages, then I'll link two videos below, one that goes over finasteride doses and another that goes over dutasteride doses. The point is, though, is that a 5-AR inhibitor is a foundational treatment for any androgenic alopecia intervention protocol. Direct androgen antagonists may help, but they have never proven to be as effective as 5-AR inhibitors. So if possible, everybody who is suffering from androgenic alopecia should be using a 5-AR inhibitor. But what about people who cannot tolerate 5-AR inhibitors when administered orally? Well, there are topical versions of both finasteride and dutasteride, but they still absorb systemically and thus may not be a viable option for people who are really sensitive to 5-AR inhibitors. So what other options does someone have if both oral and topical 5-AR inhibitors have failed them. Sure, they could try direct androgen antagonists, but the problem is, is that some of them lack clinical data, like RU5841, so we have no evidence of its safety, and others, like Fluoridol, have not been shown to be more effective than 5-AR inhibitors. There are other androgen antagonists in development, like Clascoterone and Pyrolutamide, but these are not commercially available yet, and the jury is still out on their overall effectiveness. So, is there any way to get around these limitations with 5-AR inhibitors in a way that doesn't compromise the drug's efficacy as a hair loss treatment? Well, that is the very idea behind dutasteride mesotherapy. Now, dutasteride mesotherapy should not be confused with topical dutasteride. That is a different subject altogether, and I actually made a video about topical dutasteride already, which I'll link below, but this is completely different. Dutasteride mesotherapy is a form of dutasteride administration that involves a direct injection into the epidermis of the scalp as a means of getting the drug to the hair follicles while minimizing systemic absorption into the bloodstream. The reason why it may have less systemic absorption than topical dutasteride is because it only needs to be used once weekly or even less frequently as opposed to topicals, which probably need to be used daily or at least every other day. So, in my original video of topical dutasteride, I actually mentioned dutasteride mesotherapy and referenced a study about it, but there are actually several studies on dutasteride mesotherapy, some of which are more recent. In particular, this article here from 2020 looked at the data on dutasteride mesotherapy and compared the results to the results seen with oral dutasteride. So that's good. We probably want to know if the results are comparable. So anyways, this was a meta-analysis that looked at five randomized control trials of oral dutasteride and three randomized control trials of dutasteride mesotherapy. The first dutasteride mesotherapy was the one I briefly went over in my video on topical dutasteride, but let's go ahead and take another look at it. This trial enrolled 28 men with androgenic alopecia with Norwood scales ranging from 3 to 5. The men were divided into two groups. The first group was the treatment group and they received mesotherapy using 0.05% dutasteride solution. I should mention here that this study was performed in Egypt, which is second only to good Korea in terms of hair research, but apparently it looks like the only available dutasteride solution in Egypt at the time was not pure dutasteride. It also contained some vitamins, namely D-panthenol, biotin, and pyridoxine. This is important because the other studies from Egypt we'll eventually get to also use the same solution. So it's hard to know if these other vitamins in the solution had any effect at all, be it positive or negative in combination with the dutasteride. Generally speaking, unless you have a very severe deficiency, then vitamins are pretty much worthless for treating hair loss. But it is always a little annoying when these studies include other compounds as it confounds the data even if the other stuff is generally worthless. Anyways, besides the dutasteride mesotherapy, 
chemotherapy group. The other group received injections with saline. So it was basically just a placebo group. In a study like this, it's important to have a placebo group, partly so that neither the subjects or investigators know what treatment they are getting, but also because some people feel that the trauma of the injection caused some kind of inflammatory response that improves hair growth. I mean, that is the basis behind things like microneedling. So if this trauma had any effect, which I doubt, it would be hard to tell if the dutasteride was helpful or just the needling was helpful unless everybody got needled. So you might be wondering, why didn't these Egyptians try finasteride mesotherapy? After all, finasteride is the treatment more commonly prescribed for hair loss, so why go straight for dutasteride? Well, the investigators say that finasteride wasn't used because injection of finasteride caused excruciating pain and, quote, all patients refuse to continue this course of therapy, unquote. So why is finasteride more painful than dutasteride? Who knows? But it is clear that the pain makes it a non-viable option as a mesotherapy. So the subjects got weekly injections for four weeks, then injections every other week. The endpoints were hair counts using digital photos, investigator evaluations, and patient self-evaluation. The study lasted for 12 weeks total. Well, what were the results of the study? First of all, we could say that just injecting saline into the scalp does no good at all. The hair count measured in a one centimeter diameter circular region actually decreased by an average of 0.173 hairs. In the dutasteride group though, the hair count increased by 7.739 hairs, which was statistically significant. The investigators and the subjects noted more improvement in the treatment group in about 93% of subjects, while the investigators noted improvement in 29% of the placebo placebo group. The subjects probably had a more realistic assessment because they noted improvement in only 7% of the placebo group. This figure here shows an example of what happened in the treatment group. The image on the left is before and on the right is after treatment. The next figure shows what happened in the group that just got plain saline injection. So no real changes there. As for adverse effects, there was pain, headaches, and tingling from the injections whether or not they got dutasteride or saline. So since both groups had these side effects, we we can attribute them to the injections rather than to the actual treatment. In fact, the investigators mentioned that four subjects needed topical anesthetic, so apparently mesotherapy can be pretty painful. On the plus side though, there were no sexual side effects, but unfortunately the investigators did not measure serum DHT levels, so it is hard to know how much systemic absorption there was from these treatments. So. That was just the first study on dutasteride mesotherapy, and even though it was interesting, it didn't give us very much useful data that we really wanted. Fortunately though, we now have a second study, which was a larger study that also looked at serum DHT levels. So now we can get an idea of how much systemic absorption there was from administration of dutasteride mesotherapy specifically. This study was also from Egypt, so Egyptians really like needles it seems, and it is titled, quote, Evaluation of the Effect of Injection of Dutasteride as Mesotherapy therapeutic tool in treatment of androgenetic alopecia in males." Unquote. The investigators enrolled 90 men with androgenic alopecia, and this time they were divided into three groups. The first group got pure dutasteride solution, which was 0.005% dutasteride dissolved into polysorbate 80. The second group got the same Egyptian dutasteride solution as the first study, which was 0.05% dutasteride with the vitamins added to it. Notice that this concentration is 10 times higher than the concentration of the pure dutasteride used in the first group. The last group was the placebo group, and they received saline injections. The treatment was also longer in the study. The subjects got weekly injections for four weeks, then injections every other week for one month, then monthly injections for three months. So overall, longer term than just the 12-week study from last time. The researchers evaluated the response using trichograms, investigator assessment, and patient self-assessments like in the previous study. Well, the best results were seen in the subjects in the second group, the group that got the Egyptian dutasteride 0.05% concoction. Unfortunately, the investigators didn't look at total hair counts on the trichograms for some unknown reason. The researchers did, however, find increases in the percentage of hairs in the antigen growth phase and a decrease in the number of hairs in the telogen resting phase. There was also a significant increase in hair shaft diameter in both groups getting dutasteride treatment. Once again, the placebo group didn't show any benefit from just saline injection. 
injections. This figure here shows an example of the response to the treatments. Looking at independent observer assessments, these trended towards seeing improvement in the two tetasteride groups, but once again, the patients themselves were the most critical, actually saying that there was no improvement in any group. So even though there were improvements in the trickogram results, these improvements were not so evident clinically, although it is possible these patients may have had unrealistic expectations, especially since we see a lot of people who use oral 5AR inhibitors and then say that the drug isn't working for them just because they're not getting exceptional regrowth and they're only maintaining their hair. So perhaps something subjective like patient self-assessments don't really matter all that much. So let's go ahead and measure something a bit more objective, like the treatment's effects on DHT levels. Well, I'm afraid I've got some bad news. The results were very inconsistent, with the DHT levels actually increasing in group 1, which was a 0.005% deutasteride group, and decreasing slightly in the deutasteride 0.05% group, and also the placebo group. It looks like that from this limited data that there was not much effect on serum DHT levels, so probably not much systemic absorption overall. This is certainly not comparable, though, to oral deutasteride that causes a 90% reduction in serum DHT. There were also no sexual side effects, but the report also doesn't mention pain as a side effect, so I'm not sure how attentive these investigators were to the side effects of the treatments, especially considering how frequent pain was reported in the first study. Perhaps they just told the subjects to suck it up, buttercup, you know? So now we're going to go ahead and get to the last study included in this meta-analysis, which is also from Egypt and is titled, quote, Mesotherapy Using Deutasteride Containing Preparation and Treatment of Female Pattern Hair Loss, Photographic, Morphometric, and Ultrastructural Evaluation, unquote. This time, the investigators looked at women with androgenic alopecia, which although there are some differences in the pattern of hair loss of women compared to men, it does appear that the mechanism is still due to excessive scalp DHT, so these results should still be applicable to men. The investigators found 126 women and randomized them into two groups. The first group of 86 women underwent mesotherapy with the same 0.05% deutasteride mixed with vitamins that the other studies used. The other group of 40 women got injected with the saline placebo treatment. The injections were weekly for eight weeks, then every other week for a month, then one more injection a month later. The response was assessed after 18 weeks using photographs, a hair pull test, assessment of hair diameter, and patient self-assessment. The results showed improvement in 62.8% of women on treatment versus only 17.5% of women on placebo. So for those who haven't heard of the hair pull test, that is basically when the subject or investigator pulls a clump of hair and counts how many hairs get pulled out. I do not think it is a very good test because it depends on how many hairs you try to pull out and how hard you pull, and there's no universal metric for determining this. But for better or worse, it is one of the tests they utilize in this study. So here's a breakdown of the results. The hair pull test resulted in fewer pulled hairs from 5.6 hairs before treatment to 3.9 hairs after treatment. Hair diameter also increased from 25.8 microns to 34.6 after treatment. There were no changes in any of these parameters in the placebo group. Also, patient self-assessment indicated improvement on treatment. We also have some photographic evidence, so here are some examples of the improvement seen with deutasteride mesotherapy. Also, here is an example of the improvement in hair diameter that was seen. One interesting finding was that the longer these women had androgenic alopecia, the less effective the treatment was. In other words, if they were diagnosed 20 years ago, the treatment wasn't as effective as if they were diagnosed 5 years ago. There was an inverse correlation between the duration of androgenic alopecia and the efficacy of the treatment as shown in this graph. This was also seen in the first Egyptian study I showed, the Abdallah study. The treatment worked best in those who were recently diagnosed with androgenic alopecia, and it worked worst in men who had long-standing diagnosis. I think this is not just true of deutasteride mesotherapy. I think this is a general rule for any treatment of androgenic alopecia. The longer you wait, the less likely you're going to get a good result with the treatment. Therefore, starting treatment as soon as possible is extremely important because once the hair follicle dies, fibrosis will replace the hair follicle with scar tissue, and by then, it will be too late to save your hair. Finally, in this study, the researchers noted that the main side effect was pain, but the pain was the same whether the women got injected with utasteride or just saline, so again, this was just a consequence of the injection and not the drug. Mesotherapy is painful, so that's something you'd have to take into consideration if you are contemplating doing it rather than just popping a pill and getting it done with. So let's get back to the meta-analysis that I started out with. Like I said, the meta-analysis compared five studies of oral dutasteride with the three studies of dutasteride mesotherapy that 
that we just went over. Unfortunately, only one of these mesotherapy studies actually looked at changes in hair counts, so the conclusions are limited here. However, in the average of oral studies, the increase in hair counts was 15.92 hairs per square centimeter, while in the mesotherapy studies, the increase was only 7.90 hairs. This figure here shows a summary of the comparison between oral dutasteride and dutasteride mesotherapy. So there was not enough data to form firm conclusions, but it does seem that oral dutasteride is more effective than dutasteride mesotherapy. There were no reports of sexual side effects with dutasteride mesotherapy. However, even with oral dutasteride, the five studies did not show a statistically significant increase in sexual side effects compared with placebo. So sexual side effects from dutasteride are very low, even if you are taking it orally. It's possible that dutasteride mesotherapy's risk of side effects are even lower than oral dutasteride, but unfortunately, this does seem to come at the expense of efficacy since the research shows oral dutasteride is more effective than dutasteride mesotherapy. Additionally, another big limitation of mesotherapy is that it is painful and it requires professional administration from a doctor. It isn't like oral dutasteride where you just pick up your prescription and then just take a pill as prescribed by your doctor. The other limitation here is that there is no long-term data on dutasteride mesotherapy, so it's not clear that any benefit it gives short-term will last in the long-term, especially since efficacy is so much lower than oral dutasteride to begin with. So dutasteride mesotherapy might not be worth the trouble. If you are very sensitive to a 5-air inhibitor like finasteride side effects, it is probably a better idea to just take a smaller oral dosage of the drug. Finasteride can be titrated to doses as low as just 0.1 milligram daily and still be effective. Will it be as effective as the standard dose? Maybe not, but dutasteride mesotherapy isn't as effective as oral dutasteride either. So if you are going to use a 5-air inhibitor in a way that minimizes the risk of side effects, even if it comes at the expense of some efficacy, then you might as well just use low-dose oral finasteride and forget about scalp injections altogether. Now, is dutasteride mesotherapy better than nothing? Sure, and if even the tiniest effective oral dose of finasteride still gives you sides that don't go away on their own with continued use as they usually do, then maybe it is something worth considering then. But absolutely nobody should consider dutasteride mesotherapy as their primary 5-air inhibitor without at least trying oral finasteride first. It simply isn't worth the pain and inconvenience, since it doesn't look to be as effective as oral 5-AR inhibitors. Remember, hair loss is a lifetime battle, so factors like convenience, ease of administration, and cost are very important factors. Also, there have been some reports of scalp abscesses and mesotherapy actually causing hair loss, although these are just anecdotal reports, but I'll link those case reports below in case you want to take a closer look at them and review them anyways. Now, I did find one other study on dutasteride mesotherapy, which I'll link below, but this study was just a letter to the editor, and the study only included six subjects, so I don't think it adds much to the data we already have on dutasteride mesotherapy. These investigators, they used a 0.01% dutasteride solution and gave the injections less frequently, only once every three months. After six months, there was improvement in hair density and hair diameter by tricoscope, but the letter to the editor gives no actual hard data, like hair counts. Also, there were supposedly no changes in serum testosterone and DHT levels, which is consistent with the outcomes in other studies. Unfortunately, there was no placebo control group, so overall, this is not a very high-quality study at all, especially since it had very few subjects and no outcome data that can be compared to the other studies we already talked about. So, to summarize all the outcome data we have, dutasteride mesotherapy does seem to work, but not as well as oral dutasteride or oral finasteride. We also know that the side effects are mostly related to the pain of the injection and not due to the drug itself. The data on the treatment is limited, and given the pain and probable expense as well as the inconvenience of mesotherapy, it seems a lot easier to just stick with oral dutasteride, or better yet, just stick with oral finasteride, where there's a whole lot more data, especially long-term data, and especially since finasteride is an actual FDA-approved treatment for treating hair loss, while dutasteride isn't. Now, if someone were in a situation where the only option was to either use dutasteride mesotherapy or use nothing and just shave it, bro, I would go for the former option, of course, but there is no logical reason to use dutasteride mesotherapy if all other pharmaceutical options have not yet been exhausted. So if you get side effects from 5-air inhibitors, push through it for a few months as they'll likely go away on their own, and if they don't, then try a lower dose. If dutasteride mesotherapy is to be considered at all, it should be considered a very last resort act of desperation and not as a primary treatment under any circumstances. So with that, it's time for me to return to care more and continue on the path. See you next time, I'm fellow hair loss witchers. Thank you for watching.